Okay, so we are, it's the 11th of July today, um, and this is, oh, I don't know how many um, Rockwell Park Greenhouses community, uh, gardeners question times we've had now, um, but we have a special guest today in Jo Homan. Uh, jo works as uh, the Education Skills and Training Manager for, um, oh gosh, I'm so sorry, Jo. The Orchard Project. The Orchard Project. The Orchard Project, uh, which is a charity that brings orchards to the heart of urban communities um, and has a mission for every household to be within walking distance of a community run orchard. Um, and Joe is going to um, kind of give us a presentation today about the different things that the Orchard Project does. Um, and then we've got an opportunity to ask a Joe a bunch of questions. Um, we can also field some of those ourselves. And we've had a couple of questions come in from um, from people who uh, are interested in getting answers to their queries um, beforehand as well. So I've got those in my back pocket if we want to um, go ahead. But I wonder, Jo, if you fancy um, kind of getting started with the things you want to tell us. Yeah, you're, you might need to make me um, a co-host because my screen sharing thing's not working at the moment. Okay. So you might need to change my permissioning on the uh, Okay, it's working now. So that's cool. Where's my... There we go. If other people want to mute themselves, that's probably a good idea. Just so we don't hear your chairs shuffling around. Um, okay, so yeah, as Alice said, I'm the Education Skills and Training Manager for the Orchard Project. Um, and I've got an interesting background. I've done a few different jobs. Uh, I started a project called Edible Landscapes London in Finsbury Park, which is a forest gardening project. So it means that my kind of specialised areas of knowledge are forest gardening, but also setting up training courses. Um, so I've set up a couple now, so I'll tell you more about that later. Um, and the Orchard Project, uh, Alice you gave an excellent introduction. So we're um, based all over the place. We've got about 15 employees. We're in London, Leeds. Manchester, Edinburgh, Glasgow, and we're opening up an office in Wales as well, in Swansea at the moment. And we did our interviews yesterday and the day before, so that's exciting. Um, we're, there, we're on a mission to create more community orchards and also help maintain existing ones. This map on, on you can see is some of the orchards that we've worked with in London, so planting and restoring. So restoring means that there might be some veteran fruit trees that need special care and slightly different care to the care needed by young fruit trees. Are you all able to hear me okay? Because I'm, I'm sitting in a fairly relaxed way, quite far away from the computer's mic. So yeah, maybe I'll just move you, you a little bit nearer. Um, so yeah, I was going to tell you a little bit how the, about how the Orchard Project's mission to help communities become more resilient and care for fruit and discover the pleasure of eating homegrown food. I was going to explain how that mission kind of that vision that pans out but also explain how the organization has evolved slightly very recently to incorporate more things to do with well-being and um, oh there's someone wanting to come in and um, biodiversity and also polycultures and forest gardening so um, yeah I'll explain more about that so, um, outputs of orchards uh, are numerous so here's a nice summary we uh, obviously we get lots of apples from orchards and a cider which I know some of you know quite a lot of this about um, we also can learn loads which is a great place for people to come together to learn informally informally to bring in people of all different ages, wonderful community spaces to celebrate. They link people with their local history by learning about what fruit varieties may have been developed in their area. Um, and they also kind of connect us to each other and also with nature. They're very beautiful places to be in. And they're also, of course, wonderful for biodiversity because they create lots of ecological niches for lots of different forms of wildlife to live in and they provide ecosystem services such as cooling and uh, capturing water. So let's go into a little bit more detail about those. 
so food and drink. Um, I've actually I recently moved up to Walthamstow, just down the road from our cider house, um, which is on on Forest Road. And what the Orchard Project does is we collect um, apples. So we collect about nine tons a, a year and we press those and we make um, lots of apple juice and some cider, which we call Local Fox. And at the moment we've got two lines in Local Fox. I cannot remember the names. I think it's a Rambler and something else. So they're both, it's basically a very nice cider. It's quite strong, about 6%. And we've started selling it online through a website called Pedal Me Supermarket, which is brilliant because it delivers your food by with someone on a bike. Um, and they cycle with all with your boxes of cider and what other whatever other food you want. Um, so it's a very environmentally friendly way of getting getting food to your door. And if you're buying local fox, you're buying something that has been made in London with with London produce. So it's just really cool. Uh, we also make apple juice. I think that there might be um, a connection with Rockwell Park. I don't know if you want to chip in, Alice, what you know about that. Yes, yeah, so um, in our community greenhouses, we are now um, selling the apple juice. Um, so that's one of the things that you can order on our website and come along and collect. Or if you happen to be visiting, um, you can kind of take some bottles away with you um, as, a, as an option. It's really lovely. Okay, cool. Yeah, so we have a, a press in, in Walthamstow and we kind of squeeze all the apples, make the juice, make the cider. Um, and we also, in the past, we had a link with Bulmers, um, which led to some interesting partnerships, but that's no longer the case. And yeah, we're fully independent at the moment. And I guess one of the great things about that is that food and drink cider is sort of helping with food security, but we could obviously do a lot more to make sure that our community orchards make a meaningful contribution to, to food security. People, bringing people together. So um, the Orchard Project offers lots of support to community groups. So our model is that we work, generally speaking, we work with existing community groups. So if there's a group on an estate or um, maybe a church group or some a Friends of Park group that wants a new orchard, we work with them to help them through that process and we give them advice, we have loads of information on our, our website. Sometimes we have pockets of funding to work in particular geographical areas, so then we can give a, a bit more support. Um, and we usually train up a couple of people from that orchard group to become what we call orchard leaders, and they're the kind of designated contacts for that orchard group. They get extra training from us. There are also people who we call orchard mentors, and they may have a connection with several orchards across London, because they have got a deeper, even deeper knowledge, so they get even more training from us. Um, so the orchard mentors um, are often ready and willing to give support to more than one orchard, and we match make the orchard mentors with needy orchards. Uh, we get emails all the time from orchard groups asking us for help, so we kind of try our best to match those requests uh, and offers up. Um, and so in the picture on the right hand side there, that's um, taken up in Lordship Rec, which is in Tottenham. And the woman who is the main orchard leader there, Sally, is also an orchard mentor. So she offers informal to support, support for a few other orchards that are physically near to where she lives. And then the guys on the left hand side next to that, um, I think it's a plum tree, they're doing some orchard mentor training with the guy in the foreground, is called, a guy called Bob Lever. And he's um, based up in East Anglia and he's like an apple expert. And so he's giving them some quite detailed information about veteran tree care. Uh, we also like celebrating orchards heritage, so bringing people into, into their local orchards. So the middle picture is from um, Merton Fruit Festival, which we organised a few years ago to celebrate the uh, fruit heritage that, that is located in Merton, which is where the John Innes Research Institute used to be based before they moved out of London. Um, and in the, in the past, in the 1910s to the 1940s, they um, developed lots of apple cultivars uh, down there and plums and cherries uh, and pears. And so we had this wonderful festival inside a local community orchard there to celebrate those different varieties. Um, so we also like to bring people into orchards to celebrate Blossom Day and um, to do wassailing in the winter because there's things you can do throughout the year in orchards to sort of celebrate them and mark them. 
So this is part of my job I, I'm, as the education skills and training manager. This is very much my area. So the informal training that we do with children and schools and the, um, with adults as well, we do kind of single days of training and weekends of training. Um, so we have lots of lesson plans that people can download. Um, and we've had got lots of experience of working with schools to kind of bring, bring um, children into their local orchards so that they kind of can do things like biodiversity spotting as they're doing there or apple juice tasting or whatever it may be. And uh, yeah, we, we just love raising people's skill level um, through lots of as many different ways as we can. I also, um, one of the reasons why I started working at the Orchard Project was that I had experience of um, creating accredited training from my project in Finsbury Park, Edible Landscapes. I created a forest garden training course when I was there. And so, um, yeah, a few years ago, I started developing an accredited training course in Orchard Management, which is a level three certificate. And we've run the course, we've finished it four times, but we're on our fifth iteration now. And the sixth lot are gonna be starting at the end of August. And we've had about um, 53 students have finished the training. There's 15 doing it at the moment and then there'll be 15 more. Um, so they basically go through 12 different days to, all to do with orchards. So they'll be learning about the pruning, the grafting, the maintenance, the surveying, the design veteran tree care, Apple ID, all of the different aspects of, of orchard management. And it attracts people from different ages, different genders, different uh, ethnic backgrounds, different classes. It's a very um, accessible course. We managed to increase the range of students who are coming onto that training by having pay by volunteering places on previous courses. We also had some designated young person spaces and that worked quite well. Um, so yeah, it's been pretty successful at getting people in an interesting mix of people onto the course, but also lots of them end up going into good uh, further training or into employment. Uh, some of them end up becoming orchard mentors for us. So I think with the fourth lot of students, we had an opening at that point to get some more orchard mentors. And we asked the guys from that course, do you want to become an orchard mentor? And I think more than half of them wanted to become an orchard mentor so it's quite a nice way of them keeping a connection with the orchard project um, and they also get a lot out of it those, those students because they they're doing those 12 days together they form a really strong network with each other they also have the opportunity to connect up with other students who've done that course and they also link up with lots of different orchards throughout london so it's connect there's something to do with connectivity and people uh, and that work just works really well with with this kind of uh, good quality and in-depth training which i'd say is a real strength and um to bring this even further to develop it even further and to allow us to do this outside london more easily we're in the process of developing an online version of the course which uh, has five face-to-face -face days and the, the remainder of the days is covered with online learning so we're creating a range of videos at the moment and PowerPoints with voiceovers and PDFs and quizzes and things like that. This will be launching in the autumn uh, and it'll be launching in London and then we'll be launching it in Manchester, probably will be the next place. Um, we've also recently come, reached an arrangement with the Agroforestry Research Trust in Devon to develop a forest gardening course. Most of the material is ready for that. We just need to get the um, build some build a qualification around it um, and that will be launched in January so um, we've, there's been a lot of development in, in training for us recently so um, I mentioned before that the orchard project is moving towards polycultures and um, biodiversity and this is my final slide but there's quite a lot of information on here um, and so I yeah I'll spend a bit, little bit of time on this um, so the idea is, is that if you start moving orchards towards polycultures, you are able to make some very fascinating uh, changes uh, that are also very effective at helping bring a real solution to food security um, for, for people in urban settings and also in a boost, giving biodiversity a massive boost as well. So if you imagine that you've got a traditional orchard, maybe an arrangement of five, plus trees 
and around that orchard you add some other features such as a, a, a shelter belt made out of uh, shrubs that have got edible berries in and then you add some other features within the orchard such as um, ponds um, compost toilets and which you can then use the, the urine for as a form of fertilizer um, and then underneath those trees imagine you add some berry bushes and some herbaceous perennials and some ground cover plants and some climbers you then start having something that instead of being an orchard it's more of a food forest or a forest garden or a polyculture um, the, the name isn't hugely important is is really it's just that it's a it's the way forward for orchards um, because it means that you can have food throughout the year you can have um, ramsons in the spring cherries in the summer medlars in the autumn and saltbush leaves in the winter and it means that if some one of your yields is low so this year for example lots of plums have had pocket plum and so i imagine that there'll be fairly low yields of plum which would be a problem if you only had plum trees but if you have a range of different trees shrubs ground cover plants climbers it means that you're always going to get a yield of something and then because you've got all these different layers of with all producing food and uh, and performing other functions you are automatically creating lots of ecological niches and you're creating habitats for lots of different organisms to live in and you're creating a range of different food sources so therefore of course you're going to increase the biodiversity and because you've added things like a shelter belt um, and you're testing out lots of unusual new plants you're making your orchard more resilient to any of the external shocks that may come in such as uh, extremes of temperature and very strong winds and flooding and things like that because you're spreading your risk out and you're also protecting your trees because they're not so exposed um, so um, there's quite a lot to talk about here um, I think I have covered a lot of it. I suppose things to add um, are that in this kind of food growing approach, you tend to use perennial plants so that you only have to dig once to put that plant in is the, is the usual approach. You try and avoid doing lots of digging uh, up of weeds by having sheet mulch as much as you can with quite a thick layer of, so you'll have cardboard with wood chip on top is a typical kind of approach. So you're then not having to dig out weeds and you're also adding a feature that's going to help uh, protect the soil and retain moisture and build fertility. Also building fertility, you will include things like nitrogen fixers in your shelter belt, but also as part of your underplanting. And that nitrogen will help bring nutrients into the soil, which will be used by your nutrient hungry trees. You'll also be planting mineral accumulators that will have the same kind of function of bringing up nutrients that can be used by your fruit trees. Um, already talked about the multifunctional aspects of shelter belts. Um, yeah, they're basically just a wonderful way forwards. So that's why the Orchard Project is trying to move away from just encouraging people to plant trees in the middle of their park and thinking more about, well, how are those trees going to do if they've if they've got the wind blowing across them, how are those trees going to do if you've got just grass that's next to those trees? You know, it's not really an ideal arrangement. Uh, they, they kind of need to have different requirements uh, and the grass isn't actually giving us a, a terribly useful yield. It has one useful thing, which is it's good for sitting on, if you're having a picnic, um, if that grass is being kept mowed. So it's trying to kind of make, make the things that you include in an orchard um, serve more than one purpose and be there for a reason so it's more about a mindful um, intelligent way of planting so yeah that's that's kind of what we're moving towards more now so I think that's probably the end of my presentation Alice thank you and if you've got some questions or if people, other people have got questions mm -hmm. they wanted to ask I think we should throw it open to questions Thank you very much for sharing that. There's a ton of information in there about how we might start thinking a bit more, um, I guess, holistically about how we plant and maintain 
different fruit trees and, and really thinking about things as a system rather than individual uh, individual plants or you know one-off things so i wondered um i might start by throwing it open to the floor we've got a number of people um here does anybody have any questions and if you do raise your hand oh, so chris it looks like you've got a question are you happy to unmute yourself and I think I am unmuted. Away? thank am you I unmuted? yes great uh thanks very much joe um it, uh, i just wanted to um ask if um, any of the participants were local because of course um, the things that Joe has been describing are exactly how we manage our own orchard. Um, you can see, well, I don't think we've quite got as far as mineral accumulators mm -hmm. but we certainly have um, different layers, protective barriers um, and we're producing a lot of soft fruit um in that so you can all come and see uh this sort of orchard management process um at uh, at Brockwood park community greenhouses um joe did do you know our garden yeah yeah we did in one of the earlier iterations of the yeah, course no I, I thought i recognized you yes um so you you trained cats didn't you yes and right. David, um, who have continued to maintain the orchard in in that sort of way yeah, and I'm actually coincidentally doing some cat sitting up the road. So if you're if you're if you're open today, I could probably nip down and uh, have a look on uh, this this very Saturday afternoon, which would be nice. Yeah, um, yeah um, Kate is there uh, running the garden. Cat is not there. David won't be there because he's still shielding. Um, but he's in on days when there are no other activities uh, taking place. Um, but yes, it's open till. Well, it's open till four to the public, but I mean, you'll get in until five because Kate will be there. And okay, there. so if I run down the hill, I'll be able to get there today, which would be good. Yeah, <laughs> so I'd love to see it again. It's a really beautiful garden and there's some really, it's a good example, actually. Although I think there were some issues with some of the trees being quite close together, which is a really yeah, common one. Enthusiastically planted, I think. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but they, the, they are nevertheless pretty damn healthy. Um, the yeah. ones that I saw and it, they yeah, really the kind of you can feel when you walk around it because it's quite well protected from from wind and stuff it feels very calm uh, quite humid quite you know quite a nice stable temperature in there yeah. and that's because of that that way that it's been planted up uh, you can really feel it interestingly um, because of the current situation we have had to engineer a one-way system around the garden and the way in which we've done that is to push people immediately into the orchard um, and so many people have come up and said oh, I've never been there before um, so a lot of people have discovered it in the few weeks that we've been reopened since um, since lockdown has eased um, but we hope you'll agree that uh, it, it's in pretty good shape and um, mm. and we've really tried to look after it um, well. And um, just as I mentioned, uh, anyone who is local can of course um, come and uh, um, engage with the orchard. And if you want to do more learning about the orchard, then informally with both Kat and David and more formally as we run in the very early part of the year um, pr pruning uh, courses um, you can get involved with that so, and we're always looking for people who would like to volunteer in the orchard there's always work to get done yeah and it is a great way to learn just doing it formally or informally in, in groups it, it, on a job that just needs to happen like it's the best way of doing it isn't it yeah yeah absolutely and there there is a significant pruning task if you include in that the the soft fruit um, because we've got a really large amount of soft fruit um, which, which, uh, which needs pruning and uh, getting people to sort out the various methodologies for the types of currants and berries that there are is something that's very popular each year. Um, so, uh, right, I've monopolized enough time here and I'm also very worried that my video is going to crash my machine so I'm going to um, uh, turn off my video and uh, see if there's another question. I, it occurs to me there's a couple of people who are don't have video. Diane and Amy, who um, may yeah okay Amy's 
Amy looks like she's got a question. Yeah. Hi, yes, can you hear me? Yes. Perfect. Okay, excellent. Um, yeah, just to echo what Chris said, actually, the one-way system in Rockwell, the orchard, works really, really well. I, th I went down a couple of weeks ago now, and it was and it was brilliant. Joe, thanks for coming to talk to us today. I just wanted to ask. Um, I was really interested in um, what your organisation does, and I just wondered how it comes about. Do you contact spaces, or do spaces contact you? How do you sort of restore and work to create these orchard spaces so there's a constant sort of background level of communications to us where people are asking for help so it may be a particular friends of group approaching us and saying we've got the we've we're taking over management of this land can you give us some advice on how to plant our new orchard so they get that kind of query a lot unfortunately we're not always able to give them actual help beyond look at our information pages on the website because there's not we've only got three project managers in London um, and only one in each of our regional offices at the moment so um, we tend to it tends to be very funding based so we usually get pockets of funding that may be geographical um, and then we are able to work with a group um, or we may get the funding may be working with a particular group um, and so then we'll be doing some outreach so we have a basically keep a log of all the queries that we have coming in. Um, we also have things like we did a we got some money from the GLA last year and we did a micro funder and we had about I can't remember how many groups it was like 20, 30 groups came and came along and they bid for money to get some some, uh, you know, equipment and trees for their orchards. But actually what people really need, I mean, it's you, you can plant an orchard with practically no money at all. You know you can get hold of the physical things it's the it's the information people want um and that's what's quite hard for us to give you know on an ad hoc basis so yeah we are a bit limited unfortunately robert you looked like you were wanting to say something earlier on but you're on mute yes hi um I, in fact i did your leaders course last november which was excellent and and, and in fact, I've done some pruning courses at Brockwell Park as well, both the summer and the winter. So, um, but I'm also part of Open Orchard West Norwood and only been for a year and, and, and got quite involved in quite a few of the, uh, they've got about six or seven orchards about the place. And so your points highlight so many things that I'm realising. I mean, we've got, a, we've got an orchard in West, uh, sorry, at Norwood Park which is, you realise that was badly placed. I mean, you mentioned before about, I mean, it, it, it's very exposed. It's on the crest of a hill. The east winds we've had this year have been just lethal for it. And we certainly need to be thinking about um, shelter bouts and things. But this year we've introduced, um, uh, uh, since I did the course, uh, we've introduced um, mulching of the trees with wood chips. And, 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 and uh, in fact, I've been mulching this morning right up until midday, which is why I was a bit late here uh, getting on. But I, I think the Orchard Project is such a wonderful organisation and resource. I've sent queries to you and got excellent advice back since. Um, I, I do have one question and it's about pruning um, stone fruits, which is it's coming up now. And do, do you um, recommend um, uh, sealing the cut with any sealants, or do you just leave it open to the air and, and okay. And, then, and our general guidance is that if you need to make larger cuts on a pruner, so just for people who aren't sure, I'm pretty sure you probably all do, but we're talking about the cherries, peaches, apricots, plums, all of those ones, the stone fruits, the ones with the, where the genus of prunus. Um, and so if you're making, if you need to make a large cut on a prunus, then if you do it near the beginning of the months where you can do it which i think is may is the first month it's the ones that don't have r isn't it so it's may june july august and um, so if you do your big cuts in may they'll have longer to heal and create that kind of occluding wound wood around you know mm. to kind of protect themselves before the winter um, and then you can prune as late as august but ideally just little snippy cuts then okay. um yeah but yeah we don't advise and neither does rhs or anyone really sealing up the wound because that's the tree has its own mechanism for doing that yeah that was my only question but thank you thank you that's okay it's, it's topical 
It's also some of the time, this is a time for pruning um, any of the trained forms that you may have as well. So trying to kind of maintain an, a shape of something that's restricted in some way happens over the summer. If you were to do it now, you might have to do it again towards the end of the season because it might put on extra growth. But anyway, sorry, no one's asking about that. So, yeah. Well, we had a question come in from somebody who isn't able to be here, but I guess maybe they'll uh, want to watch back. And I also have an answer from our gardener, but they were asking about pruning gooseberries. Um, and there, so this is um, Catherine T. And Catherine wanted to know whether she'd uh, read online on a kind of how to that you could prune um, at the beginning of the summer and, and in July. And she'd seen a blog post on our uh, on Brockwell um, Park Community Greenhouses that we'd done that in our, in February, so um, right back in the beginning of the year. Um, and her question was about can she'd read that you can do it now, but I wonder if anybody on here. Uh, so Kat was don't prune. Uh, uh, so I had got and I said don't prune right now. That's not the good idea. Um, but I wondered um, if anybody else had any advice for Catherine T. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's not the normal time of year for pruning soft fruit, but I don't think, like, if you if you selected a branch that didn't have fruit on it, um, and it was like a really old one, and you pruned it now, I don't think it would be the end of the world. If you were kind of increasing circulation for the branches that did have fruit on them, then that may be a good thing for the bush. But I think the normal time for pruning most of those ribes species, so the gooseberries, the jostaberries, the black currants, red currants, white currants is towards the end of the year and it kind of ties in with you can then use the wood that you cut to make some harder cuttings so and, and a lot of those ribes seem to be able to make cuttings from the two-year-old wood so often with cuttings you're using the freshest growth but with those ones I've noticed with things that are really vigorous like jostaberries which is ribes um, yeah, hybrid ribes ex integral and maria they will fruit, they will produce roots from their two year old wood. That's how vigorous they are. So yeah, normally people prune it then, purely because I think you're getting two jobs done at once, you're taking cuttings, and you're also, uh, I guess you're doing it when the, the bush is dormant, so all its energy has gone back into the roots, so then you're not taking too much away from the bush. Mm. Does anyone have anything to add to that, who's got like particular gooseberry yeah. knowledge? Yeah. Once again, this is something that um, Catherine was it um, could sign up to learn at um, at the greenhouses. We have produced so many jostaberries, it's unbelievable. But we were able to sell an enormous number of them online during the lockdown, so we're also pleased about that. But uh, we we are taking significant amounts of fruit cuttings. We aim to produce about 50 of each of six or seven different types of fruits, so 350 or 400 cuttings a year. So there's a little production line you can learn on here. Mm. Fantastic. Thank you. Very much. Do you agree, Chris, with the approach of doing it in the autumn rather than at this time of the or autumn and winter rather than at this time of yes, the year? Yes, absolutely. Um, yeah, I mean there, <laughs> there are of course, as with any volunteering organisation, always issues about when there are volunteers. Um, but we would tend to do it in the um, in the very late autumn, very early winter um and uh, to try to strike the cuttings um so um you know, that that's what we do and i think cat's probably right although of course your 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 um uh, your point is correct if you're taking out old woods then um you're not trying to do anything else than you know, remove the wood and create the space um but it's not really a useful thing to prove this for now i don't think mm. uh, self yeah I, I don't know if it's helpful, but Monty Don was uh, dealing with pruning gooseberries last night on this week's Gardener's World. So, um, for what it's worth. Do you remember what he said? <laughs> <laughs> I think I was having my dinner. I, I, I don't grow uh, gooseberries, so I think I switched off. But I know you were looking at the so, Like I said, I don't know if it was really very helpful me saying this, but uh, anyway, that, for what it's worth. We could always go and check it out. Exactly, on iPlayer. That's, that's why we have iPlayer. Yeah. It might be useful for Catherine as well. Um, does anybody else have any questions while we're on? We've got one question about mulching that have come in, if, if, um, if we don't. But I've, I've, I've heard from uh, Diane 
I don't know if Diane has got your both invisible and silent, Diane. I don't know if you've got any got a question for us. No worries if not. Uh, I believe that Diane can hear but not see, and she cannot um, turn on video or a microphone. So although she is listening, if the, uh, if you look at the bottom of your screen, there's the group chat, Diane. So if you want to type a question, then you can of course do it there. Likely, but we'll keep an eye on that. Should we move on to that other question then? I have a question about uh, mulch because we've talked a bit about mulch and like the, the high value that we put on getting nutrients into the soil and making sure that you've got the right things in place for good growth. So question we have from Mandy is around, uh, so she, in her garden, there's a small, a small silver birch. Um, it's been there for two, at least two years because it was there when she moved in, but it's probably a lot longer than that. Um, it has had a little mulch around it, but right now, um, really, the grass is growing right up over it. And while Mandy has been pruning, uh, has been weeding around it, she's wondering, should she keep mulching underneath? Um, and if she should keep mulching, is that a thing that has to happen indefinitely, forever? Um, she really just wants the trees looking okay at the moment, but wants to make sure it stays that way. So um, silver birch trees compared to a fruit tree have, don't have, they're not as needy. So they're a type of pioneer tree, which means that they can usually colonize rubbish soil and grow fairly well in fairly challenging conditions. Uh, however, most trees don't like having competition from grass if they're, when they're young. So that may be a problem. It may also be a problem if she's cultivating soil near the tree because she may be inadvertently damaging some of the roots of the silver birch tree. Because if she looks at how wide that canopy is of the, say the silver birch tree's canopy is that wide, the roots may extend to being that, that wide. So if she's digging near to the silver birch tree, she may be you know, hurting it without realizing. Um, does she need to carry on adding mulch? If she wants to, it doesn't do any harm. Normally we, with a fruit tree, we say mulch to the edge of the drip line. Um, I guess with the silver birch tree, you could apply the same rule if, if she wants it to do really well. Um, yeah, and mulch is brilliant because it not only does it trap the moisture in, like I said before, and, and feed the soil, it also um, prevents erosion of the soil and it keeps the temperature of the soil stable. So it takes longer for the soil to overheat in the summer and it takes longer for it to cool down as well. So it's just more, more of a stable environment. And it also creates a habitat for invertebrates as well. Um, and it's not a problem for nitrogen theft unless you're growing something very shallow rooted like little annual vegetables because it, it, the, the bacteria that changes is only very near the surface of the soil. So you don't need to worry about nitrogen theft. You don't need to worry about what kind of wood chips you use, whether they're coniferous or anything like that. There's all the, those uh, beliefs about it, acidifying soil and stuff. Is uh, conifers like pine needles that acidifying soil um, are not seen to be true anymore. It's just organic stuff that breaks down. So yeah, mulch is just a wonderful thing to add. Um, and I think I've mentioned all the benefits of mulch. Can anyone think of any others? That I might have missed out. Oh yeah, weed suppression. That is another one. Weeds won't be able to germinate. Um, although of course, as your mulch breaks down, it will turn into soil, and then we'll, weeds will be able to germinate in it. But yeah. Thank you. I had a question, um, which was around, you mentioned the different training and the aspects of training that you offer at the moment, the different types of courses, and I wondered if there was. Uh, anything coming up or whether people just need to keep their eyes peeled if that's something that they're interested in doing with you? Yeah keep them peeled um, they, we haven't got any normally we offer winter training and pruning that'll be face to face so that will definitely happen this winter uh, and then pruning in the summer as well next summer we'll definitely be doing that. Um, we've got some weekends of training coming up so there's one next weekend on orchard survey and design and because of coronavirus we're limiting the spaces to five and we've, we've, only, we've got one spare space on that weekend. So it's a Saturday and a Sunday, and it's at the Calthorpe Project in King's Cross. So if anyone's interested in that, then email me directly. Um, you can email me or email the Orchard Project website or direct message me or whatever. 
Uh, my name is Joe Homan. Um, you'll be able to find me. Um, and then we've got a biodiversity weekend in August, but that's fully booked up because it's such a low number. Um, we've got an orchard management. The certificate course is starting in August, but that's fully booked up. So I guess the next thing will be the online thing that starts in sort of September, October. Uh, so yeah, keep an eye out. And if you're interested in the certificate in community orcharding, because we may be doing a face-to-face -face version of that again, if you email me, I have a notification list for when we, you know, release places on those. Excellent. Thank you. Definitely something to keep uh, eyes peeled about. Um, I also wondered if I could ask you about how you came to be in the role that you have now, your kind of path to yeah. it, a fascinating yeah. and really varied mix yeah, of things I'm, that you do. I'm, I'm a bit of a, a jack of all trades, or was for a long time. Um, I used to be a primary school teacher and then I moved into an admin role and did a little bit of print management and layout and design and all kinds of different things before I got very interested in climate change and peak oil around 2008, I think that was. Um, and then I started a transition town group in Finsbury Park. And those are um, grassroots organizations that are trying to come up with positive solutions to the challenges presented by climate change and peak oil. So it's kind of saying, yes, we've got this massive thing here. Let's not, let's get past that kind of anxiety and let's actually come up with some tangible solutions. So I started Transition Finsbury Park, which had several different groups so looking at housing and how you have you know renewable energy and transport and economic like all those different aspects and i found that my own interested interest ends up channeling in towards uh, the food growing side of things so um i started edible landscapes london um as a result of that transition town group in finsbury park um got very interested in forest gardening because forest gardening addresses so many of those challenges that are linked up with climate change and peak oil because it's about food security and local resilience uh, and also skills and things like that so i basically at the age of whatever 30 something found my focus and ever since then it's been very clear i'm a real like i'm the sort of like my work is my life kind of thing uh, that's just really all i do so i'm a bit of a sado so I just do edible landscapes one day a week and the orchard project the rest of the time and um, training and finding different ways of communicating this stuff is the thing that, yeah, that drives me learning more as well. So at the moment I'd, I'm learning about filmmaking. So I'm learning, I've learned how to use Premiere Pro and uh, the editing software to make films, which is brilliant. So as long as I'm learning and as long as I know it's tapping into something that I believe in, which is, forest gardening, then I'm happy. <laughs> so yeah. Sounds wonderful. Chris, I can see you switch your camera on, so I wondered if you had something to add. You are on mute though. Sorry. Can't hear you, Chris. I'll ask you to unmute. Yeah, right. Yes, I, I just wanted to say thank you very much for coming and uh, it's been fascinating. And to ask you again, if you do intend to run down, because if you do, I'll text Kate and tell her to expect you. No doubt she'll um, wash the forest before you arrive. <laughs> I am pretty tired, actually. Yeah. If I'm not worry. But at the same time, I am quite keen on getting it. It's in, just to reassure you, it's in fantastic condition. We're so pleased because, of course, you know, three months ago, we, we, we didn't quite know how we were going to maintain everything. But we have managed to maintain everything, actually, by completely reimagining volunteering. Um, and it's all looking lovely. Um, anyway, so. Is it open during Not the week? Because I'm here until Friday. If, Joe, if you want to come in, you, you can come in at any time. Um, if you let us know when, we'd love to see you and love to, you know, to, to hear what you would say about, uh, about the orchard. Um, we're only open to the public on Saturdays and Sundays, but um, Mondays to Wednesday, the education team are there and they will admit you. Um, and Thursdays and Friday, the gardening team are there and they will admit you too. Um, cool. Because um, I'm going to be at Edible Landscapes tomorrow, so I could bring, because the one thing that people is always a struggle in forest gardens is the ground cover, because you get yeah. some a few dominant things to take over. So it's nice to add a few uh, other tough 
things like sweet wood rough if you don't already have it or um, violence or whatever so i'm going to edible landscapes tomorrow so i could if you wanted bring some stuff down that would be lovely yeah i, I should say that uh, cat is the boss and so um even though i'm her boss's boss <laughs> i have to do what she says so but That's i'm sure she will welcome um uh having you know more additions I can't tell you what species we've got there, except at the back we've got pulmonaria um, under the trees at the back. But, but uh, there is real deep shade in the centre. Um, we, we have experimented with various ground covers, but um, it, it's been quite hard. But we have now got lots more cover around the edges with the with the soft fruit and the um, the dual purpose uh, windbreak come um, climate deterrent uh, our uh, heritage brambles um, so um, yeah <laughs> so it, it is looking great I think I'll have one more call for questions from our various guests um, anybody else or even thoughts and, and reflections on the things that we've heard from anyone. I just want to say, um, I believe this is the last, is this the last garden, um, gardening time, question time? I think it is, out of the whole series. Um, anyway, I just want to say thank you so much for putting this series on. I thoroughly enjoyed it. I've tuned in quite a few times. Um, and yeah i've just really appreciated all the work and effort that's gone in from the whole team and and josh to put on some really wonderful speakers so thank you thank you amy that's a wonderful thing to hear um when josh gets to editing this he'll be able to to hear your message it has been a, a labor of love i think um thank you okay in that case oh robert you've got a question plug for if it's okay for incredible edible Lambeth has got a uh, biodiversity uh, workshop this coming uh, webinar this coming uh, Thursday and it's on the biodiversity um, uh, crisis that we're in and it's looking at some really good speakers including uh, David Golson and uh, I've forgotten her name the woman from Lambeth uh, from Hackney who um, goes around uh, uh, naming pavement plants and, and giving praise to them rather than spraying them with glyphosate like we are still doing in Lambeth, unfortunately, mm -hmm. next month. Um, but anyway, that, that workshop is at 5.30. I think it's promoted on this week's uh, uh, email from Kate, but it, it's well worth it. Joe, if you didn't know about it, it's, if you just check the incredible Edible Lambeth web, website, Everybody's welcome and it'd uh, be great to have more people there. So thank you. I hope that was okay. Yeah, definitely. Good plug yeah. for your event. Is it, so it's on Thursday the 16th? 16th at 5.30 and, and yeah, it should be good. And, and it, was a really, it was really good to hear you, Joe. and you've re, re, reinforced food for thought about what we can do about one of our orchards anyway, which is sort of needing a bit of tender loving care, but thank you. Thank you. All right. I think what we'll do now is uh, just have a bit of a wrap up. So I'd like to say thank you very much to Joe for coming to tell us about the work of uh, the Orchard Project and sharing the knowledge that you have from that, talking about your career and, and how it's kind of got to the place where you feel like you're doing the thing that you can be most passionate about. So it's wonderful. Um, and thank you for all the questions that we've had. And the people who sent more questions in we've had from my guests. It was lovely your feedback, Amy. Thank you very much. And we've got a plug for, a, for an event for Incredible Edible Lambeth um, in the week. Um, so for uh, the Brockhall Park Community Greenhouses, um, my plug, I guess, is we've got tons of plants for sale. Um, we're open right now and tomorrow for um, visitors in the same every weekend. Um, we also have uh, volunteering opportunities that you can um, kind of get in touch about as well. Um, we run education programs and all sorts. But we, yeah, if you want to take a look on our website, find out what we're all about, um, maybe make a donation or uh, uh, think about purchasing some plants and produce, some of the wonderful orchard projects that we're selling now. 
um, got lots of things there for, for just about everybody and lots of opportunities and things we're doing with um, learning learning through growing and growing through learning and we really want to uh, hope like welcome you down so that's everything thanks everybody thank you and take care have a lovely afternoon thank bye. you thank you bye bye thank you